You're listening to The Virtue Podcast, brought to you by the Great Hearts Institute. Good conversations around the great conversation. Welcome back to The Virtue Podcast. Today I am pleased to be joined by Dr. Elliot Grasso, musicologist, performer, and provost at Gutenberg College in Oregon. He has performed before presidents, ambassadors, statesmen, both in the U.S. and Ireland. He can be found globetrotting with his Illin, that's Illin pipes, at festivals across the country, even the world. Who would have thought that your youthful interest in some obscure pipes would launch you in an international career? Welcome, Professor Grasso. Thank you so much, Rob. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Wonderful to be on the show. Well, I'm just pleased because I got a a, a foretaste, right? A little preview of these pipes. First, you had to explain to me how to pronounce them. Uh, Spelled (laughs) U-I-E-L-L-A-N-N. These are the Illin pipes, the Illin pipes. uh, And you're going to tell us a little bit about them. But hey, why don't we start with a demonstration? Would you mind playing a a little something for us? Happy to, happy to. I'm going to shift my chair and my camera a little bit, but I'll tell you a little bit about them while I'm setting them up. So these are the Irish Illin pipes. Um, It's a bagpipe that developed in Ireland in the mid 18th century, around the time of the Enlightenment. Um, Each country in Europe has their own particular kind of bagpipes, but these are mostly used for indoor dance music. And while I scooch back here, you can see kind of how how they're put together. So instead of blowing into the pipes like Scottish pipes, Right, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. I'm actually gonna plug that tube into a bellows here. So it's bellows-powered bagpipes from Ireland. And so I'm gonna plug in there, and I will put this as a piece of leather on my knee to seal uh, this thing called the chanter. I'm gonna play the melody on the chanter. So I'm gonna I'm gonna buckle myself into these pipes, and you can see there's a there's an arm belt right here, and there's a waist belt also. I'm gonna pump on the bellows, the bag moves. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play the uh, play the chanter, which is this pipe, um, has about two octaves on it. And then I'm gonna turn on these, these drones, these long pipes here turn on with a switch key. I might uh, hit these these key pipes here, which are called regulators, because there's two pipes with keys on them. And the regulator was the Irish uh, the Irish contribution to the uh, world of, of bag. <clears throat> so I'll try, uh, I'll try a traditional uh, Irish reel here for you. Nicely done. I have to say, Elliot, I am going to try to rip that clip and take that on a handheld device or other acoustic device and put that (laughs) right in my children's bedroom first thing in the morning when I'm getting them up for school because that will start a jig. (laughs) That'll start a jig. It's hard to sleep. Your leg was tapped for sure. (laughs) 
Yeah, it's definitely dance music. Definitely dance music. It is indeed. How did you come to play them? And how, how was it that you were drawn to this instrument? This is really fascinating. As you said, it's it's uh, two, three hundred years old. How'd you get to them? Yeah. Um, so my parents um, met each other during the 1970s during the folk revival in America and grew up, um, you know, doing their relationship together, uh, doing traditional Irish dancing and Irish music. So it was very much a house full of music. And when I was kids, seven, eight, nine years old, they would take me to Irish festivals and there'd be live musicians. And you know, I walked past one of the tents and there was a guy uh, coercing music out of this sculpture. And I thought, <laughs> wow, like, what a weird and interesting looking thing. There was just so much to look at it and so much going on. So I was about 11, I begged and begged and begged and they, they found the Dylan Piper in the state of Maryland um, <laughs> to, to start giving me lessons and the rest is history. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. You know, in our work as classical educators, you're, you're familiar now with Great Hearts Academies and with the work we're doing at the Institute. We are always so keen on providing students an opportunity to explore the nature and the craft and specifically the skills that go into the making of beautiful artifacts, not the least of which is music. And I'm yes. wondering, as you were practicing and developing your own ability, how did you how did you develop real confidence, real skill? Well, that's a great question, Rob. Um, I think there are a couple pieces. I mean, one is that there's there's no fast track to being uh, competent at anything. Um, it takes a lot of time and practice and lots and lots of repetition. So you have to be interested in that and, and willing to do that. And um, I was interested and in, in willing to do that. But it helped for me to have a lot of really great teachers around who I could imitate. So when you're learning to play music, um, you have live teachers here near you. You have a community that's supporting you while you're doing it. And of course, you're listening to scads and scads of world-class recordings that you hope to someday imitate. So I'm sure that um, there, were a, there were a tape or CD or two that I kept in the car and made my parents listen to it anytime we drove anywhere. The same recording, you know, 20, 30, 40 times sometimes yeah, yeah. to try to pick out all the meat from that. Yeah. That's right. Well, I appreciate you're your not offering any kind of secrets that would try to shortcut the, the hard work that's necessary. On the, on the other hand, are there any technical features of the work that you came or, you know, the skill that you acquired uh, that really were distinct for the Illin Pipes? You know, things that you just had to, to kind of come to grips with, uh, so to speak, uh, that, that, that maybe you didn't, you didn't know about when you first take, took interest. Oh, absolutely. Well, well, tuning is a huge issue, um, you know, and listening, recording myself back and listening to the tuning mm -hmm. of the instrument while I was playing it. So like, you know, I'm, I'm putting, you know, imagine trying to crush a watermelon or a, a football with your elbow. That's the kind of pressure that I'm putting on this, this bag. Sure. Um, and every note has a particular specific bag pressure at which it plays best in tune. Uh -huh. um, so well, I would practice in a bathroom, actually, which was highly resonant. You get a lot of high frequency feedback and you can tell when the tuning is off much faster than if yep. you're playing outside or kind of in a room with a lot of thick carpeting and things like that. So um, listening back and practicing in a resonant space was, was definitely, I, we could say, uh, definitely a, a secret trick that <laughs> I learned to appreciate. Now, I'm assuming that didn't actually go into the shower. That probably would not be conducive. But uh, I get the idea, right? Just the resonance <laughs> and the echo. Uh, of, of, of the bathroom would, would give you that immediate feedback. Uh, yes, sir. Pass... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say the bathroom comes with a chair already in it. So <laughs> expedites things. Well, I, uh, I, I think that the, the fact that folk music and the, the sort of folk revival, as you put it, was part of what brought you to the pipes and, and other instruments that you play and musicology generally is fascinating because of course that is very much a people movement or a you know movement from the from the from the ground up as it were uh, are there other such movements that you've seen either irish or otherwise that have really uh, launched others into uh, into their interest in music are there other movements other other kind of folk related mu you know folk music that you've seen in the last say 3 or 4 decades Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, well, what happened in the 70s with the folk revival, I mean, sort of spread beyond Ireland, certainly. I mean, there was Scottish music, English music, um, lots of different traditional music sort of started being put on the stage and commercialized in various ways. So what comes with commercialization of music is a global music industry that involves um, touring and performing and albums and recording um, and lessons and festivals yep. and, and things of that sort. So it kind of kind of spread through many parts of the world the past 30, 40 years, surely.
Well, uh, as as uh, I'm always fond of saying, we'll get some more details from you because I think that our audience would be fascinated to know more. And if we can put some things in the show notes regarding this folk revival, might sure. be opportunities for us and for our children, right? Some of us might just want to go to a local festival and expose yeah. them to some of what's on offer. But you did make a transition because not only are you a performer of the pipes, but you're also a scholar. Again, a musicologist, an ethnomusicologist and, uh, and professor and serve as the provost, the academic head there at Gutenberg College. How did you get from performance art to scholarship? Well, um, I love playing, um, but I also like helping people understand what it is that they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, so that lends itself to discussion, lends, it, lends itself to explanation. Um, so I started teaching people to play this music when I was about 16, 17 years old and, and really enjoyed it and enjoyed the dialogue of how people arrived at you know, their practice and how things were going. And just I'm very interested in people uh, personally as well. So. Um, just being the, 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 the kid, the teenager, the young adult, the 30 year old who is always asking why, why, why sort of kind of nudges you into scholarship uh, at some point if you're someone like me. So just had a lot of questions and kept looking for answers. Well, that's great. We often speak of the importance of curiosity and, and wonder. And it sounds like you have a, a long streak of that in you. And it uh, brought you to the Academy. But the Academy, in a way, that continues to cultivate the next generation of artists. And so I think that's really important. I, I did want to ask you a question concerning this tradition, uh, more broadly, musical traditions at large, but how would you define a musical tradition? Obviously, you can speak of the Irish uh, specifically, but, but more broadly, how would we actually define a musical tradition as a, as a musicologist? Sure. Well, I mean, the musical tradition is a set of normative behavioral practices that people repeat on some level with some consistency over generations. That's what mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah. yeah. And yet it's not fixed necessarily because, of course, it's handed down from one generation to the next. So how does a tradition that has those behavioral norms change over time? Right. How do they become effectively uh, integrated, if you will? Sure. Well, I mean, that's that's a great question. There's a lot of um, a lot of study and literature on that particular question, especially when it comes to oral tradition, music that's passed mm -hmm. down, not by notation or uh, books, but by demonstration and, and observation. So, I mean, when people are playing music, um, no two performances are alike. Um, people can make creative decisions that they forget or they can make mistakes that people find interesting. And someone tells, oh, that, that sounded amazing. You're like, what was that? It's like, I don't remember doing that. It was probably a mistake. It's like, I loved your mistake. I'm going to play next. <laughs> um, you have things of that sort. And then you have, um, what you could say, uh, tradition bearers. Uh, in Irish music, it would be um, the older generation who is saying, like, you know, they, they write a tune. They write a new tune. And people, they're well-respected. And, and the community says, ah, oh, we're going we're gonna to learn that tune that this this very important person has has written and we want to play it as well. So it's both, there's a conscious level and there, and there's also a, a deliberate decision-making process, I would say. In as much as the, uh, the older generation, as you said, wrote down or has written down these uh, common texts, a uh, repertoire, if you will, uh, script, I should have said compositions. Uh, how are those woven into the, the, the preparation of the next generation? That's a great question. Um, sometimes, oh, sometimes very much so, sometimes not at all. Um, you would have particular groups of musicians who are really interested in old music collections. Mm -hmm. So Irish music that was collected in the 19th century, they would go through those 19th century collections and, and thumb through and sight read stuff and say, ah, you know, I found this really great tune. Like, let's all start playing it. You see this kind of revival mm -hmm. of this tune that no one's played in, you know, 75 years. Um, and then some are completely anti-text. So, you know, you Real music isn't about reading, it's about playing, and I don't want to have anything to do with sheet music. So you really hmm. have two different sides of it as well within Irish music, at least. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Uh, you were saying earlier about the value, the benefits, really, of modern technologies and, and recording technologies in being able to broadcast performances, some of the best in the world. So our modern world is certainly saturated with uh, such music, soundtracks, if you will. Um, and in that sense, we don't have to make music uh, personally, right? We can simply serve it up uh, on a playlist. Mm -hmm. uh, in that environment, do you feel that musical performance has been affected? And, and if so, how? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think yes and no. 
So, I mean, for those who didn't have, who weren't fortunate to have a, a community of other players to sort of plug into, as I was fortunate to have as a kid, um, you know, technology makes accessible great music from great parts of the world, even if you're sort of doing it solo for the time mm -hmm. being, which, which is fantastic. Um, for me, I grew up in a, a community where um, there was very much an exchange culture of tapes. So bootleg tapes of live recordings. Uh, yeah, you would go to the record store and you would buy the new CD, um, but then you would want to get your hands on that cassette tape from you know, the German concert from 1978. You would listen to that you know, like, yeah. it, was, like it was hot for, for a long time. So, so both things um, took place. Well, I, the reason I ask this question is that it seems as though what you describe in your own story, and I assume in the folk revival generally, is something of the inspiration and the, the attraction of, of the amateur, the true amateur, the one who just loves it, right? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how do you personally go about inspiring uh, a recovery of making music, again, when you could just, and I've, I've literally had my children say this, right? When I got them at their piano lessons, yeah, but I, Dad, I don't need to do that. I can just tell Alexa to serve it up, right? <laughs> yes. How do you, how, how do you inspire them? That's what I'm interested in. How do ah, we how do we no. how do we draw them into and attract them to uh, to the performance and to the making of music? Well, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I like like anyone. I too started as an amateur, um, mm -hmm. but it seems to me that I came to love music because the people who loved me loved music too. Mm -hmm. And so I think a big part of inspiring that that perpetuation is to, you know, create casual, caring, loving communities where music is just normal thing. It, it's not super special. It's not hard to do. It's not an elitist activity. It's it's not uh, dismissed either. It's it's just part of part of eating and drinking and, and having a conversation. And so I think creating earnest engagement and building communities where it's just, you know, come come with whatever musical skill you have and participate as much as you want, but you're invited, you know, this is a music making party, you know, um, do what you can and uh, we'll, all, we'll all do it together and then we'll meet up next week or, or something like that. And that's very much uh, was my experiences, you know, I wasn't any good as an 11 or 12 year old kid playing, but everyone was just sort of like, yeah, you know, if you know that tune, you play along and we'll play with you and then we'll try the next tune. It was very, very casual. <laughs> and it sounds like from what you've told me that casual amateur atmosphere permeates the work you're doing at Gutenberg. Is that right? Are you doing such a thing at the college? Sure. Yeah, we, we have a performing ensemble here. We, we play for dances. The students love to dance. Um, so I, I go through and I organize the music for the dance. And then um, we get we get the dean and some alumni and students to get together. We, we try out these tunes and we get them up to speed and then we play them for the students and they dance. And it's not, uh, it's not about excellence in performance or pristine technique or things like that, but just doing something together. and It's great fun. Mm -hmm. Well, just in case, as I said, if our audience has questions, maybe you have some things we should read or more appropriately listen to. So do you have any suggestions where we can learn more about the Irish or perhaps other folk music that our listeners might want to consider for themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are two books that came to mind for those looking to get started in Irish traditional music uh, understanding and things of that sort. One is called Folk Music and Dances of Ireland by Brendan Brannock. Uh, it's from the 1970s. Brendan Brannock was a music collector and musicologist and also an Illin Piper in Ireland um, in the mid 20th century. And the second book I'd recommend is called The Pocket History of Irish Traditional Music by Garode O'Halloran. And uh, both Brethnock and O'Halloran's names are, are a little unusual to non-Gaelic speakers, but I can, I can send you those spellings uh, for your listeners. Good. We will definitely put them in the show notes. And if you've got anything else for live or recorded music that we might explore, some of which is going to be found on your own website, elliotgrasso.com. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I have made some recordings and uh, I invite anyone who's interested to, to have a listen. Um, I would also recommend the Illin piping of a man named Robbie Hannon, if you find these uh, pipes interesting and listenable. Robbie Hannon, I can pronounce. So I'm going to put that <laughs> one. I'm going to tuck that one away. Uh, but there's no better way to close this particular broadcast, if I may, than to ask you to give us just a little more of one of those Irish jigs, if you're ready. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Let me uh, plug Because I know it's, it's, it's something of a, a, you know, a procedure to get hooked up there. Um, and now that you've told me, now that you told me it's a, you know, like trying to squeeze the air out of a football, I can't believe you're not sweating, you know, even from the 90 seconds you gave us earlier. 
<laughs> it's it's well, it's aerobic, is it not? Aerobic exercise. Oh, it's it's quite cardiovascular. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now that's that's one of those things that you pick up from this working on it as a kid is it's a little bit a little bit easier. But sure. I'd be lying if I say if I said I weren't sweating. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here, let's see here. Okay. Here's another one. Magnificent. And I tell you the true and acid test, Elliot, is that our producer's 18-month-old was in the back jumping up and down to the beat. <laughs> that's that's a guarantee you're on to it. Uh, Elliot, we are so thankful that you were able to join us today. I know you're busy as a provost. That's a, that's a full-time job to be sure, not to mention the rest of the things that you're doing. The fact that you have offered to come down to Phoenix in February and play those pipes again at our national symposium, I don't know how I lucked out. I mean, I'm, I, you know, that's, that's what I'm really excited about. So thanks so much for your time, and we look forward to seeing you in person with pipes in February. It's my great pleasure, sir. Thanks so much for having me on, and look forward to seeing you in person. Take care. Registration for the 2023 National Symposium for Classical Education is now open. Join us February 22nd through the 24th in Phoenix, Arizona for three days of unsurpassed scholarship, professional workshops, and networking opportunities. For more information, visit www.greathearts.institute. Working together to renew the tradition.